through all of it. Um, I will say, though, uh, Dave and Cheryl, I think I saw you guys here somewhere. Um, you, you will come back to a house uh, when after your trip. I think everyone kind of caught that it's your old house that's going to get moved, not your, not your new place. So uh, rest assured, you will come back to a dwelling <laughs> when you return. So we're kind of we're getting into this uh, series that we started a couple weeks ago, and Derek spoke into it as well on this idea of Christian praxis. And uh, I don't know if you've seen if you I don't know which way you come into the building when you come, but if you if you walk past that kind of foyer part over there where there's the coffee and there's the pallet wall, like did you notice that sign out there that has kind of like all the ideas of like what we're gonna like touch touch base over the the next coming uh, weeks with this service? If you haven't, you got to walk by there and look at it. It's so good. Uh, I did not make that at all. Um, that was uh, Crystal Malenko made that, and it looks amazing. So you got to go take a look at that, and it also might be a. Uh, an indicator uh, it give, might give you a bit of space to know, like, okay, you know what's what to be expected, what's coming in this series, and uh, as you've forgotten, I mean, if you happen to forget anything that uh, we had talked about here, you can have that as your reminder as well. Uh, but looks really cool, so I'm, I'm very grateful to the creativity of uh, Crystal to bring that together. So just as kind of a reminder as we move into this, what Christian praxis means, because like I said before, I think it's a very pretentious sort of term. Uh, it requires a little bit of definition, and so I'll just offer that again too. Uh, as the kind of the, the front end of that, the simple part of Christian is, is a person who is a follower of Jesus, someone who has decided to uh, um, turn from wrongdoing, to receive forgiveness that Jesus offers us, and is now seeking to follow him. So that's a Christian. And praxis is this Latin word that means a uh, putting into practice, putting into action something that you know to be true. So a, a theory, a philosophy, an understanding, but you're now putting it into practice. So as we put those together, it's this, uh, those that are seeking to follow Jesus, putting into praxis, praxis, practice, <laughs> what Jesus has taught. So that's what we're talking about when I say Christian praxis. It's putting into practice the things that Jesus has taught. And that's exactly what this firm foundation is. Jesus said that those that put into practice what I have taught are like one who builds their house on the rock. And when the storms come, when the wind comes, it's not going to fall. It's not going to crash to the ground. So that's, uh, that's kind of the, the idea that we've had there. Derek Moodley from Freedom House last week talked about what it looks like to serve the needy, to help those that maybe cannot help themselves. And it's really fascinating. I, I don't know, for when you've bought a car and you think like, man, no one has this vehicle. And as you start looking for that, you see them everywhere on the road. I feel like it's similar with this. When you're aware of something that you can do as like, wow, Jesus taught this, and we're invited to practice it this way, all of a sudden you see like, oh man, this need is around me all over the place. So I hope you had great opportunity this last week to help those around you that, uh, that needed help in some way. And I hope that it was made aware to you, because that's sometimes the piece we miss, is that you are doing this, and then you're forgetting like actually just point out like, wow, I'm actually doing this already. Like this opportunity came, and I I stepped into it. I had kind of an odd opportunity with that this week too that just kind of gave me pause of being like, whoa, that's actually what's going on here right now. So that uh, it's probably going to show up the more you're thinking about it, the more you're aware of it. So we had that first piece that Derek gave us. Uh, before we move into this, this next bit, I just want to uh, highlight something that, that this week was like, oh, what a great summary. Again, to this theme of Christian praxis, of what it means to actually act out the things that we believe, because it is more than just belief. Our, uh, our life as a follower of Jesus has, is rooted in belief, and uh, it is built out and shown in the way that we act out the, that belief, in the way that we do that praxis. So in, uh, this is just one paragraph I want to read from a devotional that I've, I've been going through that's about talking about Exodus in this part. And, uh, and Exodus is a fascinating book, and you should go read it. We're not going to read it this morning. But uh, let me read you this, which summarizes, again, reminding why we're here, why we're doing this piece of Christian praxis. Uh, so it's about, about half the book, talking about Exodus, is a gripping narrative of an obscure and severely brutalized people who are saved out of slavery and into a life of freedom. So it's kind of that narrative story, half of the book. The other half is meticulous, some think tedious, basic instruction and training in living the saved, free life. 
The story of salvation is not complete without both halves. I just love that summary. I love that it's, it's rooted here from the very beginning. When uh, God brought the people up out of, out of slavery in Egypt, like you saved them, but they needed to know how to live, how to operate as the people of God. There's this actions p- part with it as well. And so that's why we're doing this. That's why we're here, is to see that, yes, we are saved. We have been bought at a price. We have been delivered over. We have forgiveness of our sins through what Jesus has done. But then there's a bit of like, so how do we operate in this life of faith? How do we operate as a follower of Jesus? How do we operate in this Christian walk? And so forgiveness is where we go today. Forgiveness and praxis. Forgiveness and practicing that. Uh, And the truth is that we've been forgiven an incredible amount. And we're going to look at that a little bit closer this morning too. Not at what you've all been forgiven. We're not just laying it out. So-and-so has been forgiven so-and-so, and they did this, and that sort of thing. We're not airing that all out. But uh, in general, we know that we've been forgiven a great amount. And Jesus told this wonderful parable that really emphasizes this and has some pieces in there that kind of have a bit of a, huh, well, how's that going to sit? So we're going to look at that one. It's in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 18. You can follow along there. That's where we're going to be looking. Matthew chapter 18, and it's going to be verse 21. Matthew 18, verse 21. This is going to feel for some a common parable you've heard before. Uh, The the interesting thing with some of the parables that Jesus told and and how the gospel writers engage with that is is often interesting to me anyways. And uh, the the gospel of John has a little more of its own story. It's the least like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, But there's always these ones where a a certain parable will will be retold in Matthew and Mark and Luke, and some kind of like maybe in two of the three. And this one is only told in Matthew, which, uh, that's just a fun tidbit as you're uh, you're turning there, but uh, that would have some some bearing on why Matthew wrote his gospel as well and why he chose to include this one for the audience he was addressing. Anyways, let's read the whole parable. It's verses 21 to 35, and then, uh, and then, with that in the back of your mind, we'll come back and I want to highlight some things through the parable as, uh, as I find interesting and helpful to give us the framing for uh, what Jesus is, is uh, telling across here. So in verse 21, it starts. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Or it might read 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. I'm in, this feels really wrong. Oh, no, we're good. Never mind. (laughs) Uh, Who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he said. And I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So perhaps, like I said before, a familiar parable, one that you've read or heard before, uh, perhaps not. But let me point out some things in this uh, parable that give us a little more maybe context, a little more punch to it. Because again, we're reading this with our uh, eyes in 2024 and the culture around us and what we understand. We don't pay things with bags of gold or silver anymore or get people thrown in jail for not paying their debts to us. Maybe we do actually do that a little bit more. Uh, But anyways, let me point out some things that uh, bring this to the hearers that would have heard it the first time. So coming back to the beginning here again, Peter coming to Jesus. And I love how Jesus like uses this opportunity. This is a teaching opportunity and we're not going to miss this one. Because Peter's coming in like, 
actually some graciousness here. So he's, someone's done something likely uh, to Peter, and uh, he said, Lord, how many times should I forgive this person who's done something to me, like, who sins against me? Up to seven times? And so we look at that and think, like, oh, well, we know what's coming, so it looks a bit stingy. But he was actually being incredibly gracious. Uh, there was some, some rabbis that taught that for certain sins, and it doesn't seem like those sins are laid out exactly what they are, but for certain sins, that forgiving, there was provision to forgive up to three times. So uh, certain, someone does something to you, up to three times, you can, like, that's, that was the, the rabbi's teaching, you should forgive them. Like, you're being plenty gracious up to three times. So Peter, thinking he's being, like, very gracious in, indeed, like, seven times, like, it's way more than what we've been taught. Like, if I hit seven, I'm getting close to someone with seven already. So uh, when can I tap out on this and I don't have to forgive him anymore? But then Jesus answered him, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Uh, so great when, like, I, I feel sorry for Peter some of these times. Like, he gets to be the example of a lot of things that we learn. Uh, but so many times we are Peter in these as well. So that helps us learn as well. Uh, but Jesus goes into this, like, not, not this. Like, and if we... Look at it as 7 times 70, 490, 77, whatever it is. The idea is keep forgiving because if you're counting and keeping track, they're like, ooh, I'm up to 63 with this person. Like, we're getting close. I can hold it against them soon. No, that's not the point he's making is that, like, keep on forgiving. Keep on forgiving. So then he starts to tell this story. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And now, just being mindful of parables here, it's easy, because I see I'm doing this right now. I'm going to go through this parable and, like, point out things. And sometimes we want to take that as, like, there's my lesson. That's what I wanted to grab, that piece out of that parable. And let's be careful to be mindful of that. A parable is to take the whole parable. We see the message of the whole story. That's what the message of the parable is. So we can't dissect and say, pull this little truth and be like, ooh, I like that. The kingdom of heaven is like a king. It's like, oh, take the whole thing to see what the kingdom of heaven is like. So it's like a king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Now this picture, uh, I don't know, like, not many of us have probably seen 10,000 bags of gold. So we don't maybe have necessarily a, a context for what that looks like. And it's, it's interesting to like try and calculate the, well, what's the weight of what that would have been? Because the talents was kind of a weight. And uh, look at gold prices. But how pure was the gold? So figuring that out is an interesting exercise all on its own. But the idea was this. It is an amount that would not be payable by anyone here. Not be payable by anyone that had, that was listening to this story. Now, I feel like we have a tough time in conceptualizing large amounts of people and large amounts of wealth. Um, partially just because we live in Elm Creek, so conceptualizing large amounts of people is an odd experience. Some of you have been in large amounts of people, and, and uh, when you go to a big city, and, and maybe you've been at a, a sporting event where you kind of get maybe like 20,000, maybe 50,000, a concert or something, or maybe you've been in a setting of even 100,000 people, and that, you look around that, you think, wow, that's 100,000 people, like, that is wild. That's not even, that's not even a million. You need 10 times that to get to a million, and then you need another 1,000 times that to get to a billion, and there's eight of those in the world. Like, we have no concept for large amounts of people, but I think also not large amounts of wealth the way there are some in the world. Now, there's this fascinating exercise, that's, which for some, you'll, you'll get this, uh, for others, uh, just bear with me, that uh, I think gives us kind of a concept of what ridiculous amounts of wealth look like. So, there, this is a fictional calculation. Some people on the internet have fabulous amounts of time for, for different things that we get to enjoy and other people get to criticize. So there's a fictional character in, uh, in the, book called, uh, the book The Hobbit called Schmog, and he's a dragon. And like dragons do, they accumulate gold because that's what dragons do. And so somebody went off to uh, figure out, well, how much, how much is Smog's actual hoard of gold worth? 
we could probably figure this out. We can kind of guess how, how big a dragon is, and we can kind of make some volume estimations and, and look at this. So someone went to task on that, and they calculated, this was the first time, it was back in like 2012, and they calculated that it was about $10 billion that this, this uh, mountain of gold that uh, the dragon had accumulated. People didn't like that a whole lot. That's, there's no way that could be accurate. And they start going to task on like, how that must be wrong. Oh, people love time. It's fantastic. So then the, the fellow that did the first calculation figured like, fine. I'll, I'll add some of these provisions in here and we'll, we'll recalculate and, and put some, uh, some new information into this. So this was still in 2012 and this was published in Forbes. <laughs> and, uh, and then at that point it came to a value of saying $62 billion is the amount then. Okay, so we've updated like this, this, gore, this gold hoarding dragon has $62 billion worth of treasure that he sits on that uh, he keeps for himself. Again, there's been other ones in more modern uh, internet search that show it to be around 51 million. Who cares? The interesting thing with this is, if you look at a gold that owns 50 million dollars worth of gold, there's about 25 people in the world that have more wealth than that dragon. That's an odd one to sort of process, that there's people in the world that have more wealth than a gold hoarding fictional dragon. <laughs> and like, a lot more. But that's the point of this story as well is trying to make people understand that there's this amount that makes no sense that someone could have racked up that much debt. Number one, like this servant, what was he doing? Gambling problem? Or like made some bad investments and kept making those bad investments? How did he spend this kind of wealth? Because the kind of wealth that Jesus is talking about here is an amount that maybe a king might have been an annual income for a king, it might have been an amount that in actual coinage wouldn't even, even have existed in that quantity in that kingdom that he's talking about. It's an unfathomable amount of money. And when we think of that as well, we need to think of like, okay, this amount of money that like, sure, Elon Musk could write the bill and maybe a few other people could pay that off, but it is unattainable for us in our entire lifetime to kind of pay off that sort of debt. This is the amount of money that Jesus is referencing. Something that we don't have a mental concept for something that we can try and imagine but even if we did we cannot pay off it is too huge it's a massive debt so it's this unimaginable amount and then that he's actually racked up this kind of debt is absurd as well so there's these big wows that keep coming through as Jesus is telling this story and then verse 26 at this the servant fell on his knees before him he be patient with me he begged and I will pay back everything nope mm -mm. No way he's going to be able to pay back everything. But he's trying, right? Got to try. I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Huh. You could just imagine the gasp from the crowd. What? He let him go? How could he let him go? He owed that much, and he was willing to just let him go. So the crowd is sitting on the edge as they hear this story. This, there's a, a lot of big numbers and then big ridiculous responses to those numbers as well. He lets him go. And then look what happens. The servant went out. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, which to be fair, wasn't nothing. It wasn't just his lunch money. It was a little bit of money. But you think of the contrast and that's the point. A mountain's worth of dragon hoarding gold compared to a month's wage silver coins something that was just absolutely minimal minuscule compared to what he had been forgiven and what does he do he grabs him and begins to choke him like you do Pay back what you owe, he demanded. I always have this image in here, which uh, <clears throat> I was never allowed to watch Simpsons growing up for good reasons. But uh, that, that image of Homer choking Bart, that's just like, that's always what comes into mind here with this one. So uh, anyways, pay back what you owe, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged. Exact same response. He begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. There's actually a chance he could have paid it back. It was an amount that was, uh, that was fathomable to be done. But he refused. Instead, he went off and the, had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that happened. So now they're letting him know, hey, this is what this servant was doing. This is what's happening in your kingdom. Like, we know you forgave him. Look how he's acting now. Master called the servant in. 
You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to, be tor- to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And then Jesus finishes with this verse. This is how the heavenly father, my heavenly father, will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now that part always sits with me a little bit. Where I hear that and I want to say, no, Jesus, you're like, what do you, what do you go and say that for? And then I want to justify it to be like, well, it's just, you know, like, let's soften it a bit. You can really mean that, right, Jesus? Like, you're a little more gracious and unconditional in your forgiveness than that, aren't you? Like, what's, what are you trying to say here, Jesus? Do you really mean this? Or are you just maybe making a point? Like, it's the same thing as the, the, the amount of gold. It, it's, ex, it's exaggerating. It's hyperbole. You're just trying to make a point, right? But it's not the first time and the only time that Jesus says something like this. We actually see this back in, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. When we look at the Lord's Prayer, which is Matthew 5. Yeah, Matthew 5. And our, uh, no, 6. When it has the Lord's Prayer in verse uh, 9 through 13, you're familiar with that. And there's that line in there. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. And then Jesus' words in this here as well. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. What? What are you saying that for, Jesus? Do, do you really mean that? Or are you just trying to make a point? Is this a little bit of hyperbole? Are you, are you just exaggerating because people need to really know that, uh, that you need to forgive other people? What's going on here? There seems to be something significant at stake for Jesus' followers. If we have received forgiveness of the mountain of debt that we owed, but we do not extend that same forgiveness to those around us. What's at stake here? What's Jesus really trying to say here? Now, I have a, I have a couple answers or thoughts for that. Uh, the first one, the first answer I have is uh, kind of a short answer. It's a little bit of, I don't know. Jesus said this, and I believe that he said it, and I believe that we need to sit with the weight of him saying that. And I'm not in the place of, God. I'm not in the place of the Heavenly Father to say who receives forgiveness and who does not receive forgiveness. But what I am quite confident of is that I have been forgiven much. And it is worth my effort to take very, very seriously how I live with those around me and my willingness to forgive those around me. Need to take this seriously. That's the first part of, uh, of an answer for that that I would suggest, is that we need to take this very, very seriously, because Jesus seems to make a point of the weight of what is going on here. You have been forgiven much, so forgive others as well. You have no footing to say that you have done less and that you don't have to forgive the person around you. We have no footing to have that because we have been forgiven so, so much. Second part in this of what's at stake here is that the unforgiving person is playing into Satan's schemes. There's, uh, uh, at the end of that Lord's Prayer, there's also um, guard us against the evil one. And uh, there's this piece that uh, Paul says, which uh, addressing forgiveness, I'll just point to it kind of quick. You can turn there if you want. You don't have to. It's 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, verse 10 to 11. And he's addressing a specific situation that was going on, but then he summarizes after that when uh, saying like, you know, it's time to forgive them and in verse 10 of of, uh, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 10 he says anyone you forgive I also forgive and what I've forgiven if there was anything to forgive I've forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake then verse 11 in order that Satan might not outwit us for we are not unaware of his schemes because when we do not forgive turn into a bitter bitter person And bitterness is the enemy's tactic in his arena of expertise. So we play into the enemy's schemes 
when we sit in unforgiveness to those around us. Third thing, when I think about what's at stake here, is that we do need to take it seriously, as Jesus is making the point, is that uh, we, need to not, we need to be aware of uh, Satan's schemes. And uh, third thing I be- believe, is that, believe is at stake is your freedom and your joy. Refusing to forgive someone does not benefit you. Refusing to forgive someone does not benefit you. You do not win some sort of fictitious game by holding a grudge. You do not get one up on someone by holding something against them. You do not somehow harm them by refusing to forgive them. It does not affect them the same way it affects you. My favorite illustration that I've heard about this, I want to share with you. When I was uh, at Prairie Bible College, we would have a... uh, Christian Life Week, and there'd be a speaker that would come in uh, and the, for a series of, of messages, and uh, one of the ones that stood out to me when we were there was uh, a fellow named, oh, Price, Charles Price, I think was his name. Charles Price, I think he's from the People's Church in Ontario, and uh, he came, and he talked about forgiveness over, over the weekend, or, or week, whatever it was, a series of messages. And he used this, this same illustration throughout, that uh, unforgiveness is like having a chunk of cheese in your pocket. And after a while, as you know, if you have a chunk of cheese in your pocket, it's going to start to not smell so good. And you carry that around, and there's this aroma that's around you. And people can kind of see it on you, and they can smell it on you after some point. That uh, This cheese you carry around, this unforgiveness you carry around, does affect you physically. It, it makes you a stinky person. It makes you probably bitter, because you're going to see that come out in people as well that choose not to forgive Because choosing not to forgive does not benefit you. It makes you a stinky cheese person. It's like walking around with a piece of stinking cheese in your pocket. And no Jesus follower should ever be a person that smells like stinking moldy cheese. Jesus has more for you than just that. I want more for myself and I want more for you than just that. Those around you want more for you than just that. So let me give you some super practical steps on this praxis. And and I know that this is for everyone. There's no one sitting here that can think like, well, I don't need to listen to this next part. I don't need to forgive anyone. No one's ever done anything bad to me. If If you were able to sit upright in this room, someone has done something to you at some point that probably needs forgiveness. Someone has offended you. Someone has done something to you. And if not, I'll come kick you in the shin later on so you can have some way to practice this out. Because you have had someone do something to you at some point that you did not like and that there was an opportunity to forgive. And maybe you keep a short list and you forgive right away. Awesome. If you've learned to do that, that is fantastic. But if not, and there's some stinking cheese that's still sitting with you, let me provide some super practical things that uh, have been helpful to me in the past. And uh, so I pass them on to you. They uh, come from, most. a lot of this comes, it's comes from scripture (laughs) but some of these points come from uh, Neil Anderson on uh, he has a book called a bondage breaker and uh, so some of these things that I pulled from him that are just I think helpful points for us to remember and to hear the first is this forgiveness is a choice it is a decision of the will it is something you don't just fall into forgiveness is a choice forgiveness is agreeing to live with the consequences of another person's sin It's not to say that everything's going to be made perfect in life around you, in relationships around you, if you choose to forgive. You are choosing to live with the consequence of what someone else has done, but choosing to forgive them and not hold that against them. It's also, in this way, so it's agreeing to live with the consequence of another person's sin, but it's a choice. And it's a choice to either live in bondage and bitterness and stinkiness with that or freedom of forgiveness. So it's your choice. Forgiveness is choosing not to hold someone else's sin against them anymore. Forgiveness is not always forgetting. Jesus forgets our sins. Uh, Forgiveness is moving on. Uh, Forgiveness has its boundaries sometimes too going forward. But there is no point when you get to say, I don't have to forgive anymore. Lastly on this is don't wait until you feel like forgiving because most likely you will not feel like you want to forgive someone who has come over and kicked you in the shin. 
So I want you to, I'm going to invite you into this then throughout uh, whatever it looks like for this week for you, is take time to do this. Not to just let it be an accident that happens. Take time to actually sit down and do this. Get yourself a space of time. Give yourself a space of time. If you can retreat away from people, you have to go hide in the closet, so be it. But get yourself a piece of paper and a writing stick. And ask God to bring to mind those you need to forgive. What it is that you need to forgive them for. What is the offense? Because sometimes we can, we can move on from things and it'll come up in, uh, in seemingly random times. And be like, ooh, that's still sitting with me. I have not forgiven that person. So maybe get ahead of that. Ask God to bring to mind those that need to be forgiven. And there's a bit of an oddness with this. I realize writing down names of like so-and-so. Because you start to connect. Like, oh, so-and-so. And I hung out with him at that point, And that's so-and-so's dad. And I know him. And so sometimes you kind of like feel like you're relating just thing to thing. But... It's all right. Write it down. See where God brings that. Uh, If it just needs to fall away later, that's fine. Ask God to bring to mind those you need to forgive. And then go through your list and pray this out loud. Lord Jesus, I choose to forgive Scott for kicking me in the shin because it made me feel angry. And then when that's going to come up later on, because we are not ignorant of the devil's schemes, is that he's going to try and bring that up to be like, oh, you really haven't forgiven them. See, you're still hanging on to that. Look at the bitterness you're carrying for that. You're still carrying that cheese in your pocket. You can just quickly remind, no, I've forgiven. Jesus, I've forgiven this person. And through time, that will move on. That will change. That will, uh, that will develop in a positive way. I'm confident of this. I've seen this. So there is emotion attached to these. And some things we've, we've moved on from that they are buried and they are maybe from a while ago. And if God brings up a name like that and you think like, oh, wow, that's bringing some stuff up for me. You don't have to run away from that emotion. You can give that over to Jesus as well. You can pray through that as well. God, this Jesus, this brings up these emotions for me and I need help with this. Help me, Jesus. And you know what? Uh, they might not deserve your forgiveness, but neither did you deserve the forgiveness of the mountain of debt that you had accumulated as well. But Jesus came that we could be forgiven of that. All right, closing up. Build this as a habit. You know, it's, uh, it's really important to hold short lists in this way. And, uh, and sometimes you can develop a, a routine of sitting down and like, God, like, how are we doing? Is there anyone that needs to come to mind, the people I need to deal with, things I need to process through? But then I've also experienced as well, like all of a sudden God will bring up and he'll do that on his own. And I've had times where I've been, been walking and, and uh, God will just, I don't know, or bring up like this person and like this that they had done. And I'd be like, oh man, yeah, I've been hanging on to that one. And I do feel frustrated, angry, whatever with them from what they did. And I've, I feel like I've learned a little bit better that I don't sit with that and just brood. Because that's our usual in- instinct right off the bat is like, oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for reminding me about that, God. Yeah, I've got to brood over that a little bit so that they feel the pain of that. Well, they don't actually feel anything of that, and it's just hurting you. But use that opportunity when that comes up to be like, oh, God, yes, this is something I need to process through. This is someone that I need to forgive. And take that opportunity to speak that out loud, to choose, because forgiveness is a choice, to choose to forgive them. Build this in as a habit as best you can. There's no benefit of unforgiveness Only a future of stinking bitterness by playing into Satan's schemes. Now, it might take time, might take practice, might take praxis. But there's an incredible future of freedom for Jesus' followers who choose to forgive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have forgiven us so, so much. You model that for us to extend that same forgiveness to those around us. We don't deserve what you gave us in forgiveness. We recognize that. We're grateful for it. But make us mindful of that in an ability to extend that same forgiveness to those around us. God, in this broken world, we hate that there's sin, that there is hurt, that there are people who are going to hurt us, that we, whether we mean to or not, are going to hurt others. So help us to live as a community of grace and forgiveness to those around us. As we go into this next week, make us mindful of those we need to forgive, because we know that sometimes we hold on to things that we shouldn't. And so God, I pray that you would bring to mind for each one here, for all of us, who it is we need to process through with you, who we need to forgive, who we need to 
uh, extend that grace to. Help us to do that. And God, when we do that, thank you that you forgive us. And when we do that, God, I pray that you would give us the freedom to walk in joy and lightness as we move past that. And as the enemy tries to remind us and drag us down in that, that perhaps, oh, maybe we haven't really forgiven, we just proclaim, Jesus, that you have helped us to forgive, that you have forgiven us, and so we forgive those around us, that we would not be overcome by the enemy's schemes, we would be wise to them and not fall into his traps. Help us to walk in this freedom, God. Lead us in this, we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.